Chapter Two of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Elizabeth Clett, Houston, Texas, January 2008. Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, written by herself, by Harriet Jacobs, written under the pseudonym Linda Brent. Chapter Two. THE NEW MASTER AND MISTRESS Dr. Flint, a physician in the neighborhood, had married the sister of my mistress, and I was now the property of their little daughter. It was not without murmuring that I prepared for my new home, and what added to my unhappiness was the fact that my brother William was purchased by the same family. My father, by his nature, as well as by the habit of transacting business as a skillful mechanic, had more of the feelings of a free man than is common among slaves. My brother was a spirited boy, and being brought up under such influences, he daily detested the name of master and mistress. One day, when his father and his mistress both happened to call him at the same time, he hesitated between the two, being perplexed to know which had the strongest claim upon his obedience. He finally concluded to go to his mistress. When my father reproved him for it, he said, "'You both called me, and I didn't know which I ought to go to first. "'You are my child,' replied our father. "'And when I call you, you should come immediately, "'if you have to pass through fire and water.' "'Poor Willie! "'He was now to learn his first lesson of obedience to a master. "'Grandmother tried to cheer us with hopeful words, "'and they found an echo in the credulous hearts of youth. "'When we entered our new home we encountered cold looks, "'cold words, and cold treatment. "'We were glad when the night came.' On my narrow bed I moaned and wept. I felt so desolate and alone. I had been there nearly a year, when a dear little friend of mine was buried. I heard her mother sob, as the clods fell on the coffin of her only child, and I turned away from the grave, feeling thankful that I still had something left to love. I met my grandmother, who said, "'Come with me, Linda,' and from her tone I knew that something sad had happened. She led me apart from the people, and then said, my child, your father is dead. Dead? How could I believe it? He had died so suddenly I had not even heard that he was sick. I went home with my grandmother. My heart rebelled against God, who had taken from me mother, father, mistress, and friend. The good grandmother tried to comfort me. Who knows the ways of God? said she. Perhaps they have been kindly taken from the evil days to come. Years afterwards I often thought of this. She promised to be a mother to her grandchildren, so far as she might be permitted to do so, and strengthened by her love, I returned to my master's. I thought I should be allowed to go to my father's house the next morning, but I was ordered to go for flowers, that my mistress's house might be decorated for an evening party. I spent the day gathering flowers and weaving them into festoons, while the dead body of my father was lying within a mile of me. What cared my owners for that? He was merely a piece of property." Moreover, they thought he had spoiled his children, by teaching them to feel that they were human beings. This was blasphemous doctrine for a slave to teach, presumptuous in him, and dangerous to the masters. The next day I followed his remains to a humble grave beside that of my dear mother. There were those who knew my father's worth, and respected his memory. My home now seemed more dreary than ever. The laugh of the little slave children sounded harsh and cruel. It was selfish to feel so about the joy of others. My brother moved about with a very grave face. I tried to comfort him by saying, "'Take courage, Willie. Brighter days will come by and by.' "'You don't know anything about it, Linda,' he replied. "'We shall have to stay here all our days. We shall never be free.' I argued that we were growing older and stronger, and that perhaps we might before long be allowed to hire our own time, and then we could earn money to buy our freedom— William declared this was much easier to say than to do. Moreover, he did not intend to buy his freedom. We held daily controversies upon this subject. Little attention was paid to the slaves' meals in Dr. Flint's house. If they could catch a bit of food while it was going, well and good. I gave myself no trouble on that score, for on my various errands I passed my grandmother's house, where there was always something to spare for me. I was frequently threatened with punishment if I stopped there and my grandmother, to avoid detaining me, 
often stood at the gate with something for my breakfast or dinner. I was indebted to her for all my comforts, spiritual or temporal. It was her labor that supplied my scanty wardrobe. I have a vivid recollection of the linsey woolsey dress given me every winter by Mrs. Flint. How I hated it! It was one of the badges of slavery. While my grandmother was thus helping to support me from her hard earnings, the three hundred dollars she had lent her mistress were never repaid. When her mistress died, her son-in-law, Dr. Flint, was appointed executor. When grandmother applied to him for payment, he said the estate was insolvent, and the law prohibited payment. It did not, however, prohibit him from retaining the silver candelabra which had been purchased with that money. I presume they will be handed down in the family, from generation to generation. My grandmother's mistress had always promised her that, at her death, she should be free, and it was said that in her will she made good the promise. But when the estate was settled, Dr. Flint told the faithful old servant that, under existing circumstances, it was necessary she should be sold. On the appointed day, the customary advertisement was posted up, proclaiming that there would be a public sale of negroes, horses, etc. Dr. Flint called to tell my grandmother that he was unwilling to wound her feelings by putting her up at auction, and that he would prefer to dispose of her at private sale. My grandmother saw through his hypocrisy. She understood very well that he was ashamed of the job. She was a very spirited woman, and if he was base enough to sell her, when her mistress intended she should be free, she was determined the public should know it. She had for a long time supplied many families with crackers and preserves. Consequently, Aunt Marthy, as she was called, was generally known, and everybody who knew her respected her intelligence and good character. Her long and faithful service in the family was also well known, and the intention of her mistress to leave her free. When the day of sale came, she took her place among the chattels, and at the first call she sprang upon the auction block. Many voices called out, "'Shame! Shame! Who is going to sell you, Aunt Marthy? Don't stand there! That is no place for you!' Without saying a word, she quietly awaited her fate. No one bid for her. At last a feeble voice said, Fifty dollars. It came from a maiden lady, seventy years old, the sister of my grandmother's deceased mistress. She had lived forty years under the same roof with my grandmother. She knew how faithfully she had served her owners, and how cruelly she had been defrauded of her rights, and she resolved to protect her. The auctioneer waited for a higher bid, but her wishes were respected. No one bid above her. She could neither read nor write, and when the bill of sale was made out, she signed it with a cross. But what consequence was that, when she had a big heart overflowing with human kindness? She gave the old servant her freedom. At that time my grandmother was just fifty years old. Laborious years had passed since then, and now my brother and I were slaves to the man who had defrauded her of her money, and tried to defraud her of her freedom. One of my mother's sisters, called Aunt Nancy, was also a slave in his family. She was a kind, good aunt to me, and supplied the place of both housekeeper and waiting-maid to her mistress. She was, in fact, at the beginning and end of everything. Mrs. Flint, like many southern women, was totally deficient in energy. She had not strength to superintend her household affairs, but her nerves were so strong that she could sit in her easy-chair and see a woman whipped till the blood trickled from every stroke of the lash. She was a member of the church, but partaking of the Lord's Supper did not seem to put her in a Christian frame of mind. If dinner was not served at the exact time on that particular Sunday, she would station herself in the kitchen, and wait till it was dished, and then spit in all the kettles and pans that had been used for cooking. She did this to prevent the cook and her children from eking out their meagre fare with the remains of the gravy and other scrapings. The slaves could get nothing to eat, except what she chose to give them. Provisions were weighed out by the pound and ounce, three times a day. I can assure you she gave them no chance to eat wheat bread from her flour barrel. She knew how many biscuits a quart of flour would make, and exactly what size they ought to be. Dr. Flint was an epicure. The cook never sent a dinner to his table without fear and trembling, for if there happened to be a dish not to his liking, he would either order her to be whipped, or compel her to eat every mouthful of it in his presence. The poor hungry creature might not have objected to eating it, but she did object to having her master cram it down her throat till she choked. They had a pet dog that was a nuisance in the house. The cook was ordered to make some Indian mush for him. He refused to eat, and when his head was held over it, the froth flowed from his mouth into the basin. 
He died a few minutes after. When Dr. Flint came in, he said the mush had not been well cooked, and that was the reason the animal would not eat it. He sent for the cook, and compelled her to eat it. He thought that the woman's stomach was stronger than the dog's, but her sufferings afterwards proved that he was mistaken. This poor woman endured many cruelties from her master and mistress. Sometimes she was locked up, away from her nursing baby, for a whole day and night. When I had been in the family a few weeks, one of the plantation slaves was brought to town, by order of his master. It was near night when he arrived, and Dr. Flint ordered him to be taken to the workhouse, and tied up to the joist, so that his feet would just escape the ground. In that situation he was to wait till the doctor had taken his tea. I shall never forget that night. Never before in my life had I heard hundreds of blows fall, in succession, on a human being. His piteous groans, and his, oh, pray don't, Massa, rang in my ear for months afterwards. There were many conjectures as to the cause of this terrible punishment. Some said Master accused him of stealing corn. Others said the slave had quarrelled with his wife, in presence of the overseer, and had accused his master of being the father of her child. They were both black, and the child was very fair. I went into the workhouse next morning, and saw the cowhide still wet with blood, and the boards all covered with gore. The poor man lived, and continued to quarrel with his wife. A few months afterwards Dr. Flint handed them both over to a slave-trader. The guilty man put their value into his pocket, and had the satisfaction of knowing that they were out of sight and hearing. When the mother was delivered into the trader's hands, she said, "'You promised to treat me well,' to which he replied, "'You've let your tongue run too far, damn you!' She had forgotten that it was a crime for a slave to tell who was the father of her child. From others than the master, persecution also comes in such cases. I once saw a young slave-girl dying soon after the birth of a child nearly white. In her agony she cried out, "'O oh Lord, come and take me!' Her mistress stood by and mocked at her like an incarnate fiend. "'You suffer, do you?' she exclaimed. "'I am glad of it. You deserve it all, and more, too.' The girl's mother said, "'The baby is dead, thank God, and I hope my poor child will soon be in heaven, too.' "'Heaven!' retorted the mistress. "'There is no such place for the like of her and her bastard.' The poor mother turned away, sobbing. Her dying daughter called her, feebly, and as she bent over her, I heard her say, "'Don't grieve so, mother. God knows all about it, and He will have mercy upon me.' Her sufferings afterwards became so intense that her mistress felt unable to stay, but when she left the room, the scornful smile was still on her lips. Seven children called her mother. The poor black woman had but this one child, whose eyes she saw closing in death, while she thanked God for taking her away from the greater bitterness of life. End of chapter 2